So hello everyone. Um, this morning you had your first client meetings where you probably received a lot of information. And before you start, will start working on your planning this afternoon, we would like to inspire you with a talk from uh, Johan Janssens, who will uh, talk about making good things happen. Um, and as Johan said, the first part will be from like presentation from your side, and, and then it will be if I'm gonna interactive. Do it, so I'll yeah. figure it out. Okay, that's totally up to you. Uh, okay, cool. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Jan. Um, is this loud enough, or do I need to use a microphone? Is it OK? Yeah. Uh, I brought my internal speakers. <laughs> Good. Um, maybe we can turn the lights off a bit, so this is a little bit clearer to see. So I came here on the train, and I got an email uh, from Dries uh, with your schedules. Uh, and you have this planning for the coming four weeks. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, wow. This looks a little bit like Mission Impossible. <laughs> Who has that same feeling? Two <laughs> <laughs> guys in the back going like, mm, yeah, no, it's not gonna work. <laughs> so yeah, really, because we uh, we do a lot of uh, product development and design, and I work with startups, and uh, we have this golden rule that says, in under twelve weeks, we ain't gonna get anything done. So you have. Basically 12 weeks, but no sleep. Eight hours, another eight hours, and then another eight hours. That gives you uh, the same amount of time in four weeks than we would have in those same 12 weeks. So, who is a little bit scared here? Who thinks he's <laughs> not gonna get it done? Who is 100% confident and says, pay, uh, that this is a piece of cake, one week we have our Dirty coat ready, we're going to present it, everybody's going to be happy, this is going to be easy, money in the pocket. I think you get paid, right? A little bit? Right? Bahamas two weeks after, right? Things are on, you're working quite hard on the beach. Who thinks like that? Hmm. Maybe not. Okay. So, I was also reading through all the different tasks that you have been given, and you have different assignments from different companies, as I get it and you just have meetings with them. Who had the idea that either the company didn't understand what they were asking for, or the <laughs> other way around, that you didn't understand what the company was asking for? Uh, I see a couple going there. Right. So that's another problem, right? If you're a little bit scared, and then the, at the other end you go, like, oh shit, I don't really know what I need to do. So it's all about figuring that out. That's the first step of what, what you need to do in the next 24 hours, basically. Um, and I, I missed something in all those descriptions. All of those task descriptions that you were given, I was missing something. Any idea what? It was a lot about what you need to do, right? You need to build something with e-badges and there's something with bikes and there's something with running in the city and stuff like that I was reading about. And it was all about what? It was one important thing missing. No idea? Well, I need to rewind this a little bit because I tested the sound. Whoops. Where are we?
video from the Holste Manifesto. Ever heard about that? No, look it up. It's a very inspirational little piece. I have it in my bedroom basically every morning I wake up and go, I think this actually makes my day. Um, what is are you missing in your task descriptions? If you have seen this. Why? Uh, there was no single task description that described why are you going to do this. It all said what you had to do or what the end result had, should be, but it didn't say why. What is the first thing that a designer asks himself? Why? Why am I going to do this? And then couple to that, which problem is this going to solve? And some of the task descriptions had a little bit of problem definition. What is the problem here that we are being tasked to solve in four weeks? But most don't. The first thing that we always ask our clients and the people that I work with and when I start working with a startup, people always have grand ideas. Uh, it would be cool if we could fit, take this and that and that and then we do a little bit of artificial intelligence, we build space rocket and we colonize Mars. <clears throat> what problem are you going to try to solve with that? So if you go back maybe tomorrow or to your teams, I think that's, that is the question that I would ask myself. This task here, what problem does it solve? And try to figure out that core issue, that core problem, because all the decisions that you're gonna make, you're gonna be able to bring back to that core problem. If you don't understand the problem itself, and the people giving you the assignment don't understand the problem, you're gonna be pushed in all different directions. You're gonna get lost and very scared in the end. But if you have a clear problem, a clear why, you're gonna have a clear focus and it's gonna be great to see that you'll be able to get there or at least try to get as close as possible to that. Don't be too afraid if somebody gives you a task and you only have four weeks, like I said, it's a little bit mission impossible you're trying to do here, so hats off to you to say this is too big of a problem. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Um, and that's that's part of the that's part of the the agile challenge. You have agile methodologies at school, probably. You have used them. Who has? Who hasn't? Who knows about agile? Okay, what is agile? And then everybody gets to talk <laughs> Hard questions. It's summer. You know, we have work there and everything. You know, what is agile? It's a lot, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, it, there is so much about agile. There is, there is Scrum. There is Kanban, there is factories that use Agile, there are designers that are Agile. In its core, what is Agile? It's simple. M try to use the time that you have been given in the much most optimized way possible. Uh, you only have four weeks, so anything in those four weeks that takes you too much off track, that, that's too much meetings, that, that, that takes you too much of that why and that problem, that's overhead. Don't bother with it because it's going to take you away from reaching a specific goal or a specific focus you want to get to. That's being agile. That means asking yourself a lot of hard questions. Do we need to do this meeting? Do I need to write this email? Uh, do I need to create this sketch? Do, I need to, do we need to brainstorm about this new idea? You have your task set and you have a hackathon tomorrow, I think, right, Dries? Yeah. I hack it on tomorrow to basically figure that out, and then from there it's like, like a steam train forward. You know the Japanese bullet trains; they always come on time. It's like that, right? You set you set yourself on track, and then you move forward. Um, I'm gonna skip some slides here. Uh, this is a little bit about my story, right? This is how I started. You know what that is? It's a Commodore 64. This is my first computer. Uh, this thing was super powerful. It has it had a it had uh, 16 colors of gray and white, and this was a screen. You know, it even had a mouse. We're talking uh, 30 years ago. No, more than 30 years ago. 35 years ago. No, no, 30 years ago. Um, 1989. Um, and it had an <coughs> enormous capacity. 64 kilobits of memory. You know how much that is? Kilobytes of memory. How much? I'm even older. You're even older, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, older perhaps not, but I'm from the same. Uh, uh, the same, the same era. Yeah. 64 kilobytes of memory. How much is that? That's half a second of any any piece of uh, any piece of music on your phone. 
half a second. In half a second, this computer could run programs and do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, that's what I, I learned to work with. Uh, the internet has changed quite a bit since. Um, if you talk about computer programming, and that's what you're doing, it's a very arty thing. Uh, who actually went to school where they call your education computer science? You're in the, you, you went to the wrong school. Uh, you should go to a, it should be called computer art. Why? Because as computer designers, computer developers and programmers, you are being tasked with problem solving that nobody has done before you. Nobody has, has, get, has tried to tackle the same task that you're gonna tackle in the, in the next coming four weeks. It's a new problem. A scientist, what does a scientist do? A scientist explains the world as it is. He looks at the world and goes like, hmm, this is interesting. Why does the world work like that? An artist creates, or an, or an engineer creates the world. He builds new things that don't exist yet. So to me, computer programming has nothing to do with science. It's art. Each time you're being tasked with something completely new, that's also what makes it very hard to tell the people that are gonna ask you a hard question and they're gonna ask you at some point, they're gonna tell you, when do you believe you're gonna be done? <laughs> Does anybody already know how to answer that question after those first day and a half? If I would ask you now, this is your assignment, when are you going to be done? How much time will it take? But how do you answer that question in a polite way? If the company you're working with comes to you and the boss comes to you, and I met some people in the hall and they were going like, these kids in there, they're so way ahead of me, I have no idea what you're talking about. So there's already this like, right? The, there's already this communication problem that you have. And so at some point this person is gonna go, well, I don't understand what they're doing. I have no clue how they're doing it. But maybe I can get a little bit of grip on the situation by asking them, when are you gonna be done? See, and if you were a scientist, it wouldn't be that hard. If you were uh, a builder of a house, it wouldn't be that hard because you had already built a house 100 times. So you could know, like, well, the wall is three meters high and it's gonna be that wide and need so many bricks, it's gonna take three hours. But if you're tasked to do something completely new that you haven't never done before, how much time is that gonna take? A little bit hard. So computer programming is expressing and facilitating a desire to a machine that has no clue what it has to do, but it can do it very, very fast. Um, and that's, in a sense, very arty. It's, in a sense, computer programming is a sort of literacy. It's about language. It's about a language to make the computer do things. And then I come back to what design is. Give me a definition of design. <sighs> and the guy goes, ooh, shit. What, what could design be? Come on, guys. You're all studying? Uh, something that's practical and looks good. Looks good, practical, yeah, okay. Somebody else? What's design? In the back? <laughs> Good! Exactly. It's a, it's a way of communication. Design is communication. If you design something, it is going to communicate in some way or another. A simple example. Take this thing, right? If I do it right, See that? And it goes into a certain, whoop, and there it stops. So why did it do that, this microphone? It wiggles a bit from left to right, and then it stops at this point. Why? Because the button is on top there. This is designed. Somebody thought about that. Somebody went like, if this microphone rolls over the table, it should always roll with the button on top, because the, the person picking up the microphone will see that button. The button is also aligned in such a way that my thumb will be here and there's this motion that I can do with it. Even if I don't know how this works, I don't need to read a manual to understand how this works. This, this communicates with me. That's design. So it's not only beautiful, it's practical because I can, I can use it and I can speak into it, but it also communicates with me. That's part of design. So you're designing something not just to be beautiful, because that would just make you an artist, or just, it would make you an artist. 
will make you a painter or a sculptor. You're also designing it to communicate with the people using it. To be able to do that, I go back to the thing that I said at the beginning. To be able to understand what, what that you're creating needs to communicate, you need to know what problem you're gonna solve, right? Because if you don't know what problem you're gonna solve, you don't know what communication that is gonna happen between that device, that computer program, and the user of it. So, this is you, it's pretty cool actually. This was not possible when I started. When I started, like I had this big ass computer sitting in my, my desk, it was like a desktop computer, I couldn't take it out. A, a, a few years later, I went to study at, uh, at the University in Leuven, and I had, a, I had a laptop. Well, it was more like a desktop in a big box that I could basically drag along. Uh, you couldn't really, it was really this big. Today, you can do things like this. You can basically go over all over the world and your laptop is your, your office, which is pretty cool. You can, for example, and done it before, you can, for example, take a trip to Bali and do a little bit of co-working there. You go to the beach, you go to the beach in the afternoon, and in the before noon, you work in a co-working space, and you're connected on the internet, and you can do your work. Most of our guys that work in my company, they're, they're not in Belgium, they're all over the place. We go from Vancouver in Canada to Manila in the Philippines and everything in between. That's um, all together 14 time zones. Um, which is nice, because all these people can work forever they wanna work, even if they wanna go on a trip and they wanna say, well, I wanna only start working four hours a day and I wanna enjoy life for four hours a day, that's fine. Go wherever you wanna go, as long as there's internet, you could do that. That's a completely new way of working and living and being. Steve Jobs once said this, what a computer to me is is the most remarkable tool that we have ever came up with. It's an equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. And then <coughs> I'll show you Professor, this professor. You know him? Who is watching that? Uh, uh, one. Assignment, watch more TED. TED Talks. Uh, this guy is a professor. Um, he was awarded uh, with the TED Award in 2015, I think. Um, what you see here uh, are the slums in India, like the poorest region in India. What he did was, he took a couple of computers and he put them into big boxes. Um, so what you see here are four computers, and these are all kids, the children in the slums. These kids didn't understand what a computer was. They couldn't work with the computer. They had no idea how to operate it. He brought the, those computers, put them in the boxes, and came back three months later to see what the result was. Three months later, these kids basically told them in very basic English, listen, professor, um, we need faster computers. We need we need joysticks and games. So in those three months, they had learned to use it, and they also had learned that there was something that was even more powerful than what they had, and they wanted that, of course, to learn more. And that's what Chief Jobs means with a computer is a very remarkable tool. It's like an equivalent to a bicycle of our minds. You're, you're gonna create something, a program, a tool, that is going to allow people to do things that they couldn't do before. And even worse, they're gonna be able to creatively do things with it that you never imagined would happen. Because you're gonna build something, you know, you have a problem, you're gonna solve that problem, and then you're gonna give it to somebody and say, okay, now test this. Very likely, that person is gonna use it in such a way that you have never imagined. Your first user tests are gonna go like, uh, no, and then you Try, I'm willing to help that person, right? Because they say, no, 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 you need to use it in this way. They're gonna creatively come up with other ways of using the tools you give them. That's what computers have. Yeah, they have that magical power almost. Uh, so we agree, and the person in the back completely agree with me, technology is the most powerful force in the world right now. Technology is everywhere. Digital technology is everywhere and is disrupting every little piece of our lives. Um, So, whoever used this? Wow. Electric engineers, electronic engineers? Yeah, a few, nice. That's old. Compiled languages, who speaks one or more multiple compiled languages? Cool. 
C++ people, Java people, a few, some others, maybe some C Sharp, yeah, small talk, no, <laughs> okay, so we started with, um, with, and then we moved to compiled languages. This is a list of the different ones that have been immersed over the years. It's actually quite cool to see that some of you still understand all of these languages. I, I started here, I still consider that as a very good starting point uh, of learning computer programming because you can evolve from there into the many different languages that exist today. Um, then we moved on, right? From compiled languages, we started doing interpreted languages. Why? Because compiled languages were a little bit slow. You know, you had to compile the program again and again and again, and we wanted something that we could make changes to and that kept running. So we came up with Ruby, some Ruby guys here, or girls, you, Perl, mm -hmm. mm, good. Python, uh, a bit more. It seems Python is very popular at the university today. Yeah, it seems so, that's cool. JavaScript, uh, see, <laughs> which, is, which is awesome, right? Because in 2005, um, uh, we started Joomla in 2003-ish. Uh, um, and um, at that time, JavaScript was totally not done. Now, if, if you talked about JavaScript, everybody would go, no, 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 don't do it. It's super insecure. Right? It runs in the browser, man. Don't, don't go there. And then in 2005, uh, Ajax happened. And everybody thought about the washing powder. Right? So Ajax happened. And then suddenly, JavaScript was this uber cool thing. And so really, everybody wanted to do JavaScript. You know? There was JavaScript and Ajax everywhere. Uh, my mom always asked me, like, what? You need washing powder? No, I'm doing Ajax stuff. It's all cool. Works in the browser. It's a uh, HTTP request, XML, and all that stuff. What? Um, so now, JavaScript is everywhere. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing anything and everything with JavaScript. Which is nice. Some PHP developers here. Uh, some of my friends here, too. A little less, but good. So all in, those languages make up 50% of the code on GitHub. <coughs> So if you look at GitHub, 50% of whatever is there is made out of one of those. So probably you're going to use one of those languages to build whatever you're doing. Whoever decided to do C Sharp or C++ for his project? Nobody. Somebody? Because? You specifically need it? Uh, no, because that is the assignment. So maybe you need to ask why is this the assignment? <laughs> why the hell do I need to do this in C++, right? And maybe there's a very good reason for that, and if there's not, you could maybe ask yourself, four weeks, C++, hmm, maybe I can choose something else. But if it's the assignment, still, I, I would ask some questions. Um, I'm not gonna do all that in detail, but um, basically, when we, we moved from interpretive languages in, in 2000 somewhere to to a whole new way of working. We, we, work, we started from, from writing desktop programs to writing web applications and interconnecting applications, which was super new. Um, Joomla and Drupal and WordPress, uh, the tools that we built, the, the web application builders are the first ones. They were still installed on the server. They didn't really communicate with a lot of other things, but then Gmail happened and Facebook happened and web services happened. And now we are talking about microservices and interconnecting all those different parts uh, on the internet. But still, it's much about connecting people. Slowly we're moving in a world where it's gonna be about connecting devices. In 2018-ish, there are gonna be more IoT devices out there than there are actually gonna be phones or computers out there. But right now, we're still living in a world where we're trying to connect people. And that's what made Steve Jobs build the iPhone. He did the iPad first and then basically dumped the iPad and said, hmm, this is way cooler, this iPhone, because I can have a device that is so small, fits in people's pockets, I can connect people with it. Why? What, what was he trying to do? He was trying to connect people using a device which looked very similar to a phone because people would accept that. They know that. That's a design they're used to work with. Um, and then we moved to web applications. Ruby on Rails. Somebody going to use Ruby on Rails for his project? No. Catalyst? Just Perl? No. jQuery? Ah, one guy who's going to use jQuery. Good. Well, yeah, you know, if we only have four weeks and you can, I would. Symphony, PHP guys? No. Some? Uh, some Django? No. Some? One? <coughs> so what are you going to use mostly? Node. Node? 
What else? Everybody, who, who's going to use Node? I'll add no, one, two, three, four to all JavaScript. Who's going to use something else than Node? Hmm. Yeah, what are you going to use? Uh, Ionic. Ionic? Ionic framework, also JavaScript. Yeah. Anybody going in the di React di uh, direction, the Facebook React? No. A little bit there? Okay. So you're basically going to use what you're used to working with already from the process that you've done before, or is this new for you? Our question? Is it something that you're used to, use, to working with? No, it's new. For who is the technology that is going to need to use new? Okay. Who is getting more scared because of that? A few. <laughs> yeah, okay, but it's an important question to ask yourself, right? You only have four weeks. This is basically some sort of prototyping phase for it. Time is very short. Are you knowledgeable enough about the technology you need to work with to get this done? If not, you might be wanting to go back to the, the people that they, they give you the assignment and say, I'm not knowledgeable in, in, enough in this to get it done in those 10, 15 days. There's nothing wrong with that. It's better that you get a prototype running in something that you're, that you're used to working with than that you need to use and learn a completely new technology and then not get anywhere. The time is too short for that. Go ahead. Okay. So please do not demotivate my students. I'm not demotivating your students. I'm uh, I'm immersing them in, in real life application development. Um, I'm, I'm I'm trying to immerse them a little bit in real life application development. Oh, okay. Right. You're not talking about this context. It could be this context or it could be outside. <laughs> of right. If you come if you come to work for me, right? I hire you and you go like, dude, note. I get it. React. I got it. I give you a project for two weeks and you come back and like, I'm not there yet, I need another two weeks. Then there's a very high likelihood that you're not gonna stay long there. No, no, I, I, I agree, I perfectly agree, but um, it's, it's a good thing that you tell your clients, I don't know about this okay. so much yet, but like, I think a lot of these students are going to be watching podcasts right now and exploring things. Okay. I agree, and that's great. So communication is but don't be afraid, that's the only thing I'm, yeah, what I'm trying yeah. to make, don't be afraid to go back and tell your customer and say, I'm not that knowledgeable in this. Mm -hmm. I'll try to learn as much as possible because then there's honest communication going on. Then we're getting on the, on, on the topic of teamwork, you and the people giving you the assignment are becoming a team. Mm -hmm. What is the first requirement of creating a team? She yeah. just said it. Communication. Communication. Uh, and what, what leads from communication? Work. Work does, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Without communication, work also happens. Uh, what is the result of good communication? Result. Teamwork. Teamwork, yeah. <laughs> trust. Oh. A, a, team of, a, team, a team are people that trust each other. You need to have trust in the people giving you the assignment, you know, that, that what you're being tasked is fair. They also need to trust you that you're going to do your uttermost best to get the result that they're expecting. But there's nothing wrong in that process to say at some point, and in this case, because you only have four weeks early on, that I'm not necessarily 100% comfortable here yet. Um, and then that person might say, hey, great, go ahead and research it, which is basically what you're saying. And then maybe after a couple of days, you come back and said, I researched it, I'm still not 100% comfortable yet. And then that person might say, go, go do it anyway. Or he might say, well, we're looking at least for some results, so maybe we need to take a step back and find something else for now. That's the communication that you're gonna build. <coughs> if you're doing a personal project on the sidelines, I completely agree, then go explore as much as possible. Because that basically brings me, and you're kind of like heading <laughs> in, in front of my point, which is awesome. Um, I'll skip a bit here. Um, this is the point I'm trying to make. So we went from, uh, Compiled, interpreted web applications programming platform. The last one is basically is basically where we're now at the cloud, which is web apps, web hooks, HTML5. Uh, there's so much new stuff happening. Node isn't here yet. 
uh, AI is going to be a big differentiator, microservices are things that we're doing. It, it moves forward so fast. Um, and this is it. It took us 40 years to get past compiled languages. It only took 25 years to get past interpreted languages. It took eight years to get past web applications. And in three years, this whole thing emerged. And in the last year and a half, the last six months, a lot more is happening uh, alongside it. So the technology stack that we're using is, is going like this, but it's going at a rate that is this. It's evolving exponentially. What does that mean? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> so everybody, everybody just dumps his stuff on, on GitHub and then goes like, I open sourced it. It's cool. Yeah? But there's no documentation there. So how the freak <laughs> hell do I use that? There's a, a clear lack of documentation. There is also, there is also too much right now. Uh, there is too much stuff being, uh, being thrown out there just for the fact that it's being thrown out there. Uh, there are some good stable libraries that are documented that are people are, are contributing on. And it's fine that you experiment along the sidelines because you're basically going to prove that something can be done better. That's great. But sometimes too much is too much. Um, that's one problem. What is the other problem? What your teacher or teacher participant coach was saying. Exactly. Right? The world around you cannot keep up. The, the let, let alone that you can keep up. You need. It's your task to keep up, because you're going to build all those cool things for the people that cannot keep up. The divide between you and your user is only getting bigger. And the divide between you and the people giving you the assignment is also only getting bigger. And you're in the middle there. And you're the one that needs to bind those two, the, the people defining the problem and the people that are going to try to use the solution. Um, so. That whole thing, which we call digital technology, is becoming vastly complex, which requires, one step back, teamwork. It's impossible today to get something done on your own. You might be able to write a nice little library with some documentation, throw it out there, people are going to like it and use it. But if you really want to build a product, if you really want to design a product, impossible to do this on your own. 10 years ago, I could write 60% of Joomla on my own. I didn't have to use JavaScript. I could just use PHP, and it looked very ugly, and I'm not proud of it, but I still could do it. Uh, that's not possible anymore. I'm involved in an AI startup in London. Um, we have designers, developers, data scientists. It only gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the amount of people and the amount of knowledge that you need. Exponential growth. There is a third result of this. Whatever you use today is outdated tomorrow. And the, the, the runway that you have becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. So decision making process has also become shorter and shorter and shorter. You don't have time to spend six months to decide on what to use. You don't, you don't have that time anymore. You also know that three years later, this is vastly outdated. So you're going to be outcompeted. You don't have that runway. So you need to set yourself up for change. And that is agile. Write your code in such a way that, that it can be deleted. Create your solutions in such a way that, it's, that they're modular so that they can evolve. The, the time that we created this whole monolithic, monolithic structures and monolithic applications, they're gone. We want to have layered structures where we can play in different layers and exchange different layers. It shouldn't take too long to evolve whatever you build. <coughs> gizmos that boggle the imagination. 
we enjoy every single day. I mean, devices that have more complexity and more technology condensed into them than $60 million supercomputers had 40 years ago are something we get to enjoy every day. The supercomputers of yesteryear are in everybody's hands. You know, a young person with a cell phone in Africa has better communications technology than the U.S. president had 25 years ago. So there's no doubt that these are magnificent machines that we use to extend the boundaries of our thinking and of our reach. Nonetheless, people have this problem with technology because they think it's somehow unnatural. Enter Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly's book, What Technology Wants, introduces the concept of the technium. He calls the technium the aggregate of all of our technology. He calls it actually the seventh kingdom of life. He says the technium is self-organizing. It has wants and needs and is subject to evolutionary forces. He literally says that evolution is playing out through the evolution of technology. Technology is birthed out of the human mind. If you were able to time-lapse reality, you would see our thoughts spill over into the world in the form of technology. We erect matter in accordance with our will. We reorganize the physical materials of reality and turn them into objects of higher organization. And we give them transcendent quality. I mean, today we have a device made of plastic and metal that sends our thoughts traveling at light speed across oceans of sky. I mean, the fact that I can talk on the phone with somebody and have what Amber Case refers to as technologically mediated telepathy, mind to mind communication, is not just astonishing, but also, according to Kevin Kelly's idea, proof of the flowering of new possibilities, proof that technology is a part of us, it's made of atoms, it's natural, it sits on a continuum between the born and the made. But Mr. Fuller says, start with the universe, the earth, one single system, an integrated system. We are of nature, anything that is birthed out of us is birthed out of nature. So it's all good. Nothing to worry about. This is Jason Silva. Heard about him? Some did, some not. Look him up. Shots of R. He makes this like, nice little uh, uh, videos. What you could they call a modern day philosopher. Um, what he's talking about here is interesting and it ties back to that exponential growth. Uh, he goes into the fact that the technology is evolving, but it's evolving at an exponential rate. In one of the, his other videos, he explains the concept of singularity. Heard about that? No. Some did? What singularity? Point where technology is moving so fast that it actually becomes so um, you cannot follow it anymore. Yeah. And so, <coughs> so the idea here is that technology, that the speed at which technology evolves, and this is uh, this is how computers are evolving. They are doubling in speed every year and a half. So, it's exponentially increasing. At some point, that exponential increase becomes infinite. Right. So, at that point, the rate of technology evolution is instant and there's this guy called Kurzweil Ray Kurzweil um, who created a, who, read, who wrote a book about this concept which is called the singularity is near if you haven't heard about this concept you should it's a little bit mind-blowing it's awesome for uh, for evenings with, this, with some wheat um, uh, behind Netflix specifically um, because it takes you it takes you to spaces and places you've never been before in a sense um, the thing is According to Kurzweil, the singularity, that point at which technology evolution will become infinite, is going to happen in your lifetime, and it's going to happen quite soon. He calculates that it will be in 2045, which is roughly 25 years from now. And until now, all the predictions that he has made, he makes predictions 10 years ahead, all the predictions that he has, uh, has made are true, ha have become true. For example, he predicted the, that the, the Human Genome Project would only take 10 years to complete. When they started, everybody was saying this is impossible because we only mapped 1% of the human genome in one, in one year, so it's going to take us 100 years. If you extrapolate linger, but if you go ex exponentially, then it take, only takes you 10 years. So technology is evolving at that pace, and it will continue to evolve. We're quite close to quantum computers, and then the evolution will continue at that rate. Um, why is that important? Because because it helps you to put whatever you're doing in a context. If you're working on a project, if you're working on a startup, if you're working on an idea, understanding that your idea doesn't have a linear runway length, but it has an exponential runway length, and you need to evolve faster and faster and faster and faster to be able to keep up. That's the coming 25 years. What happens then is very interesting. 
but that's for another talk maybe, or maybe somewhere in the dark bar we can <laughs> philosophize about all that. Uh, so quickly, free software. You're all gonna produce something called free software, right? Hopefully, that's the goal. Okay. So what does free software mean? Uh, free <coughs> software and the free software community and the free software philosophy and the free software movement are all about collaboration. It's all about working together. So free software, it doesn't improve by use, by simply using it, by advocating it, by mindshare, or by having it 10 billion users. It improves by participation, collaboration, and contribution. Um, you are going to do a lot of this already. You are going to participate and hopefully have some time for collaboration, but your time is very short in those four weeks. So you won't really have much time to collaborate with developers of libraries that you're going to use. A little bit maybe, but not much. But by using it, you're already participating. Right? You are reusing what others have built. You're going to make what you built available for reuse to others. The question from this was, how do you go from there to building an open source community for your little project? Um, and then the answer we had already there was that there is so much open source code and free software code available today that that is very, very hard to do. It's also not the initial goal of free software. The initial goal of free software is not to build something, put it out there, and then get 10 million users. We didn't build Joomla because we want to have 3% of the internet. We built it because we believed in, the, in these ideals. And putting it out there had a certain result. That result might be that you have people using it. It might be that you have people giving you some patches or suggesting some improvements. That's good enough, specifically if you only have four weeks to work with. So don't try to be too big in your, um, in your estimates around making it available. The fact that you're building it, making it available for others to see is great because if you later on want to get hired, all the big companies today, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, uh, Tesla, they're all gonna look at your GitHub profiles. They're all gonna look at the code you've written and how you have evolved as a developer. They even have automation tools for that. They just look you up and they will follow you even. Like I, I, I know a recruiter that w works for Facebook. What they do is they find you, they put you in their database, and then they follow your evolution. They see what code you write, what projects you work on, what talks you give, and they add that as an internal resume. When you get invited to, to say, okay, you know, here's a job, you wanna, you wanna apply for that job, when you sit in front of that recruiter, he has a whole history of you already, which is much more important than what you will tell them at that point. Um, so that, that is a great thing about putting your code out there. But don't try to make it too big. Th it, there's a big difference between the big open source project that emerged today and what we did 10 years ago. Facebook, for example, with React, which is a very big Node.js, for example, very big open source project. Facebook spends an enormous amount of money on marketing their open source project. They have a whole team that does nothing else than just that. Going to conferences, giving talks about React. Because they wanna have adoption. They're specifically marketing and spending money on that. If you get your code out there and you have people looking at it and maybe giving you a bit of feedback, that would be awesome already. Um, licenses, how do you license your code when it goes out there? Any ideas? Is that a question that came up already? Not really. It's rather by the end of the program. Yeah. So at some point, you're going to need to put your code out there, and you're going to need to put an open source license on it. There are different licenses that you can choose from. Uh, <coughs> two things to take into account. If you're already using existing libraries, you need to have a look at the, li the licenses of those libraries, uh, that they don't conflict. That's one. Uh, and two. Um, you can read a little bit into open source licenses and the philosophy behind them. There are different licenses and they have a little bit of a different philosophy. Uh, if you understand that, then you can make a choice. In the end, it doesn't really matter that much. It's important that you put a license on it. There is a lot of code on GitHub today that doesn't have an open source license. There's no license.txt file or license.md file in the repository. Um, basically, it means don't use the code. 
Because if you're using that code for a personal project, no problem. But if you're using that code in this context for a company and the company wants to start doing something with that code later, and there is no clear licensing for that library that you're reusing, then at a certain point that the developer might say, hey, but I didn't license that code under an open source license. You don't have the right to use this code in this way. So be careful with that. Uh, that's a, a problem on GitHub. A lot of the code, more than 50% of the code on GitHub today doesn't have a licensing file. So you don't know under which terms you can use it. Even because it, it doesn't mean because it's public that you can freely use it. That's the difference, right? So be careful with that. If you have any specific legal questions around that, just ask Dries and, send, and send me an email or combine maybe at the end, we, we can have a very specific discussion on that. Don't make it too complex, but be careful which code at this point you start using under what license. <coughs> so, are you a pirate? That's kind of where you're here, right? This is that little guy, Alex doesn't like him, he's a little bit punker. Shall, shall we call him Jack or Joe? Jack, maybe. Okay, right, so are you a pirate? Like, are you that kind of guy or that kind of person that wants to change things uh, and make them, wants to make what you're doing available to others so that you can collaborate? Or are you more that kind of person that will just take on the task, do what, is, what he is being told, and then just get the money and then go to the Bahamas, which is more the guy in the suit? So a pirate is more driven by altruism and reputation. And that's what open source people do. They're not driven. Um, by ego, they're not driven um, by, sh they don't want to show off, they're driven by reputation. They put code out there, they license it open source, it gives them a reputation. And it's an altruistic approach. Linus Torvalds, who built Linux, didn't go and said, hey, I wanna, I wanna take over <laughs> the world. He basically saw a problem, and he said, hey, it would be cool if we could create uh, a, fr a free software kernel operating system that other people can collaborate on. Um, and then he went from there. Um, so there is not really boundaries or regulations that, <coughs> that, that stops us uh, as open source people. We're often called hackers in a positive way. We try to change things. We try to hack things together. We try to collaborate. We try to crawl through boundaries that companies create and try to build things. The internet is built in that way, <coughs> not because a company or a government decided we need to have the internet, and because hackers together decided, let's build the internet. Um, and it will be hackers and pirates that continue to shape how our world evolves. Let alone the, 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 the Elon Musks of this world who, ha who have actually earned a lot of money and are now doing very exciting stuff. But Elon started with PayPal. You know Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. He started with PayPal. He basically started with nothing at all. And he saw the internet happening and went like, hmm, this is cool, there's nothing here that deals with money transactions, let's build something. Build PayPal, made a lot of money, and now you can basically go to the Bahamas and say, hey, you know, I'm done. I earned my millions, I'll buy the Porsche, I'll get the big villa and the yacht, and I'm done. But he didn't, di he didn't do that. He took all the money that he earned and then put it into three new ventures. All the hundred million that he basically earned from selling PayPal, he put in three new ventures. One is SpaceX, the other is Tesla, and he's doing new things on the side. And with SpaceX, he's going to go like, let's think outside of the box. Let's try to solve a problem that is way bigger uh, than anybody wants to tackle. What would it be cool if we could actually send the rocket up, up and make it land again? And everybody was going like, impossible. That's a pirate attitude. It's like, no. I don't believe it's impossible. I believe that that can be done. So I will we'll make that happen. <coughs> As Steve Jobs said, why join the Navy if you can be a pirate? Okay, so there's this nice book called Program or Be Program from Douglas Rushkoff. If you haven't read it, you should. It talks about all the things and all the little concepts that I'm trying to put into this one hour. It talks about the fact that at this point you have two choices in life. You can either be the, the user, the consumer, and you're gonna be programmed. People are again deciding what your world is gonna look like for you. Or you can be the one creating the world, programming the world. If you wanna be on that programming side, you need to keep up. You need to evolve and learn very fast because otherwise you will also slowly become programmed. And 
Douglas writes about, we are creating a blueprint together, a design for our collective future. And that's even more important today than it was a couple of years ago. Because as small groups of people... You know, I love this idea of radical openness, the free exchange of information, the free flow of ideas, creating spaces in which ideas can have sex, as Matt Ridley talks about. And this is huge, because it turns out that ideas are just as real as the neurons they inhabit, as James Coyne tells us. You know, a new kingdom rises above the biosphere. The denizens of this kingdom are ideas, because ideas have retained some of the properties of organisms, it turns out. They leap from brain to brain. They compete for the limited resources of our attention. They have infectivity. They have spreading power. They are what Richard Dawkins calls the new replicators, born from the primordial soup of human culture. Their vector of transmission is language and electronic communication. And though ideas are not made of nucleic acid, they have achieved more evolutionary change and at a rate that leaves the old gene panting far behind. You know, Ray Kurzweil says our ability to create virtual models in our heads, combined with our modest looking thumbs, was sufficient to usher in the secondary force of evolution called technology. And it will continue until the entire universe is at our fingertips. This is unbelievable stuff. It speaks to the telescopic nature of evolutionary change. More change in the last hundred years than in the last billion years. Terence McKenna actually wrote, from the moment that human beings invented language, biological evolution essentially ceased, and evolution became a cultural epigenetic phenomenon. Now, we take in matter of low organization, we put it through our mental filters, and we extrude it in the form of space shuttles and iPhones. You know, the Imaginary Foundation tells us that what imagination does is it allows us to conceive of delightful future possibilities, pick the most amazing one, and pull the present forward to meet it. You know, imagine how impoverished this world would have been if we hadn't invented the technology of the oil painting in time for Van Gogh, or the technology of the musical instrument in time for Beethoven and Mozart to unfurl through it, you know, with the revolutions in biotechnology and nanotechnology, the free exchange of information is allowing us to conceive of radical new things. Freeman Dyson says, in the future, new generation of artists will be writing genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron wrote verses. What is great in man, said Nietzsche, is that he is a bridge and not an end. You know, we're on a trajectory, smack in the middle between the born and the made, wrote Kevin Kelly. And so, radical openness is huge. It's a universe of possibility. It's gray infused by color. It's the invisible revealed. It's the mundane blown away by awe. We need to cultivate radical openness as a way of participating and accelerating evolution. This was the starting team or the team for that 2013. Uh, they just called radical openness. Um, and this, I picked this one because <coughs> it matches very closely to what you're doing here with the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, the Open Knowledge Foundation is all about openness and transparency and using that openness and transparency to evolve the world that we're living in, to accelerate that world that we're living in. It's not just about taking an assignment from a company and behind closed doors making something and put it out there. It's all about sharing how you do that with others and with the world so that other people can pick up on it and do something more from there. It fits in that whole idea. So you're, in a sense, what I'm trying to, to show you is you're, you're, it's a little bit bigger than just the task you've been given, right? There's a little bit more to it than just solving the problem that you have been given. You have impact on the world as small groups of people. You will have impact, the tools that you create will have impact on probably hundreds and thousands and ideally millions of people if they start using those. And that's very important to think about. Oops. So it's important to think about what future you wish to create because you have it in your hand. With the technology tool that you have, you can influence the world. And that seems very far from your bet, but believe me, I did it before. There, 10 years ago, we started Joomla, and 10 years later, 2% of the internet uses the technology, and 10 years later, you go like, shit, I created a bunch of crap, I should have done it different. There's a responsibility that is given to you. Um, so, the responsibility that you've been given is directly proportional to the number of people you're gonna affect with it. And it's not gonna be five people. It's gonna be a lot of people. It's the technology that we are weaving through our lives 
has implications on the way that we work, that we work together, that, that we lead our lives. It's not just creating a solution for a problem and making a lot of money with it. It also has impact. Facebook has an enormous amount of impact, aka Trump elections. I, when Zuckerberg created Facebook 10 years ago, he wouldn't have thought about that. He wouldn't have thought like, my technology 10 years later is gonna help a president win an election. That was not the problem he started with, let alone thought about that that could be the end result. So each meme pattern, metaphor, gesture, script, API becomes part of our collective future. Liking is natural to us today. Like it's just a button you press on something, right? For, for some companies, we have become liking machines. We become liking robots. We become liking farms in a sense. People want us to click the like button. Is that the future we as designers want to create? So Marshall McCullen said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. You're gonna build tools, you're gonna build technology that are gonna shape the people using that. So there's no guarantee that whatever you do will have any impact. You know, your project might totally fail and that's totally okay. But if it does have impact, the impact can be very large. As in, globally, you can, with a team of five people, create a little startup today that has global impact. That's not that hard anymore, it's possible. So you need to think about why, how, and what impact is this going to have. So ask yourself, what kind of future do I as a designer, do I as a developer, do I as a creative person want to create? Climate change, an earthquake, a suicide bomber, Terror is a nuclear device in the heart of the nation's capital. It's no wonder that we're pessimistic. It's no wonder that people think that the world is getting worse. But perhaps that's not the case. Perhaps we forget that we want to just be good. Doing what's never been done before is intellectually seductive whether or not we deem it practical. What we're seeing is unfathomably new possibilities all of a sudden becoming available to us. The future doesn't belong to the faint heart. It belongs to the brave. You have to trust in something. Your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. We truly are living in an extraordinary time. And many people forget this. what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. Where did we come from? Are we alone in the universe? What is the future of the human race? When you conduct those exercises, innovation follows just as day follows night. We can do this. I know we can because we've done it before. Stay hungry, stay foolish. It's not just about solving the problem that you've been given. It's also why, and then specifically how you're doing that and what impact it has on people using it. There's a large responsibility that you have there. Again, now I don't want to scare you, as your coach was saying, uh, but it's part of the bigger picture. Uh, and if you can weave that into, into, your, into your work, each time you're taking on new challenges, you're asking yourselves, why am I doing this? and how is this going to impact other people, then you're on the road to become a great developer, you're on the road to become a great designer, you're on the road to become a great entrepreneur. And then my question is, who from you actually wants to do a startup? Who wants to say, hey, I wanna take on my own project? Do you have any ideas? There is one. Great, 
What do you want to build? I'm, I'm not sharing my ideas. It's not yet. Secret. Yeah. secret ideas. But is there anybody that wants to go when I graduate? Some people might have already graduated or are still, most of you are still studying, I think. Like who goes like, when I graduate, I don't want to work in a company, I want to do something on my own. Think about that. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question for you to ask. You have time to figure it out. You have a couple of years to go to figure that out. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a different life you set yourself up for. It's, it's the life of putting on the suit in the morning and going to the office, working your eight, eight hours, getting your paycheck and going home and making sure that your assignments are done, which is fine. Or it's the life putting on your pirate hat and your boots and taking out your ship and say, hey, you know, let's tackle an interesting problem. Let's change some stuff that I, I can have direct impact on. It's that life, which are two different things. It's like the life of going to work for a bigger startup. Who wants to go work for Facebook? Google? Any big names that you want aspire of working for? What are you guys gonna do actually? Sit at the <laughs> beach the whole day? Come on. So other question, why did you came here? What made you sign up for this program? I'll, I'll stop picking some names. Uh, I wanted to learn. You wanted to learn, okay. Why did you sign up? You're in the middle. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, whoa, not me. Uh, also to learn a lot. To learn and a lot. To, yeah. Learning is important. Somebody in the back. The person all in the back. The last, no, yeah, well, not, not, not there. The person at the, yeah, you, 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 yeah, you, you, yeah, you're looking at the back now. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, you. Yeah. The, the blue shirt, blue shirt. <laughs> Go again. Experience. experience. Okay. What kind of experience? Working with people. Working with people important. Anything else? Don't be scared. I wanted to make something. You're about to build something. Okay. Anything else? What motivates you to? What motivated you to put your? Foot out of the out of the bed this morning to come here. Other people. Other people. It's a good reason. Any other reasons? I like coding. You like coding? Mm -hmm. oh, you could do that at home too. Just just sit behind your computer and make something. <laughs> that's something that's important to figure out. Like it's your why. Why do you do what you do? Um, why? Are you here and where do you want to go from there? It's not a goal. It's not, I want to be there in 10 years. It's more, where am I focusing on? Because there's only so much that you can focus on. You need, at, at, the, at some point, you need to make choices in life and follow a certain focused path. Um, Steve Jobs calls it connecting your dots or checking your list. And checking your list is easy, right? Which is basically going to school, getting the degree, Getting the job, getting the car, the girlfriend, the house, uh, the children, retiring, and, and you're, you're done, right? So once you have the degree and you have the job, you can calculate how much money you're going to earn, and from there you can basically figure out where you're going to end up in life, which is just checking your list. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's how a lot of people live their lives. Is that the kind of life you want to lead? You, you say yes, that's fine. Who says no? That's not for me. Okay, so what life you want to lead? The billionaire life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Many have said that. Only few have. Uh, it could be, right? It could be. It could be. But if you want to, if if you want to lead a billionaire life, like in how many years from now? Yeah. Ten years from now. Right. <laughs> so, so then my question goes back, right? So you have ten years, right? So you're now here today. Why does does the the focus of becoming a billionaire bring you here today? What does that have to do with that? It's a very interesting experience. You, there's a, there's a, the building part that you learn to interact with different people. You come out of your cell. There are inspirational talks. It's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rambling all of it. Uh, yeah, but that's important to so think about think about these things. You have been giving that amount of time. Like what I've learned is that once uh, college is done and, and you have done your initial steps, then, then work starts and then you don't have much time to figure that out anymore. 
like the, the TED Talks, the books that I, that I showed you, try to figure out, read those, read a, bit, a little bit about technology philosophers, read a little bit about, watch a little bit of TED, uh, be inspired a little bit. There's so much stuff happening out there that can help you in, in your design work and in all the other things that you're doing. Um, so, where do I want to end it? So, uh, what was... <coughs> okay, there we go, I'll get it right. So, and phrase, right? So what I try to do, what keeps me going, is I try to pursue things um, that, that are so important to me that even if I fail, the world, and that could be a very big world, but it could also be a very small world, is actually better off having me try it. And that is that you can apply that to yourself, to yourself and your friends, to yourself, your friends, and your family, to yourself, your friends, and your city, to yourself, and the rest of the world. Um, and often you fail. Hopefully you become a billionaire, and then I'll hopefully still know you, and then you know we can go <laughs> drive around with the Maserati and stuff like that. Uh, so totally okay, but probably likely you will fail. Like one out of ten startups, uh, nine out of ten startups fails, and it's a different life than than being in in, 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 in university. What is the graduation rate at university today? Thirty percent, right? Which is three out of ten, three and a little bit out of ten. In the startup world, it's one out of 10 and less. So if you want to become a billionaire, hopefully you do, and driving around in the Maserati and stuff, um, then, then you need to be a lot better than that graduation 30% that you're now in. <coughs> so why are you then here? Become better. Exactly. See, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't so hard, was it? To become better, of course. You're all here to become better, a lot better, much better. Because if you get better, then you have more opportunity going from there. Like next year, if you, if you get through this in, in four weeks and you succeed with your, with your application, next year is gonna be a walk in the park. You, you don't need to go, classes don't go to the boring, um, <laughs> read the books, watch the TED Talks, go to the, and now I'm probably gonna get in trouble again with the coach. <laughs> sure right uh, but then it's a walk in the park, right? And you can focus on other stuff. If you are better than, than, than the other 50% in your school, then school is a walk in the park, and then you can start to become better than the other 10% in your school. If you become better than the other 10% in your school, you're doing very well for yourself. And then you can either find a very nice job, if you want to go there, or you can become the next Elon Musk. And that's not a goal. It's not, I need to get there in three years from now. It doesn't work like that. It's a focus. It's a, it's a daily focus. I'm getting out of bed in the morning with the idea that I want to get better. I got out of, out of, out of bed this morning with the idea I'm going to try to deliver a motivational talk and get better at speaking for a group of young students. And hopefully I will succeed in that and I get some feedback and I, again I became a little bit better. So the next time I do this, I can take those experiences with me. That was my focus for today, right? So, and then we're ending up. You're a builder, a maker, a designer, a programmer, you make stuff. You will be making something in four weeks. That's your first goal or task. Make it work. While you're doing that, think about what you're doing and what implications that work has. There are gonna be points in time that you make design decisions or that you need to make decisions. What implications do those decisions have? Try to understand that. And when you see it in action, when you see it in front of people, also try to reflect back and say, we made those decisions, what kind of impact did that have on the people that are now using it? And you're gonna code. You're gonna create a language, you're gonna create a design, you're coders. So that's my, my wish for you in a sense, right? If after four weeks you are able to make good code, and when you present your project, you can really say, we made good code happen, we made good things happen, and we understand why and how we did that, then you became a lot better. Exactly. So I wish you good luck in the coming four weeks. Thank you.
Yuan, on behalf of all students and the uh, Open Summer of Code team, I would like to thank you with the t-shirts. Thank uh, you. Can you uh, sign it? Yeah, sure, we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 39 uh, well, signatures, but that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, do we have <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can sign it. Yeah, maybe you can. Is there, is there any questions? Otherwise, if you guys need to go, then feel free to go. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions. Go ahead. What's Joomla? Something that I started 12 years ago. Uh, and Joomla is an open source <laughs> content management system. Uh, Drupal, WordPress, yeah. Joomla. And and those three together instance. make up 30% of the internet today. So it's very similar. To that. It's a uh, project that I got involved in right after I graduated and uh, helped co found with a group of people from all over the world. So it's, it's how I became better. No. <laughs> I was thinking we were going to say a billionaire. <laughs> no, well, see, that's the thing, right? I, I then decided to give it away for free, and then you're, uh, uh, later you go, like, why the hell did you do that? And so you decided to give it away for free, so now we have a lot of people using it, and I'm very happy with that. It doesn't make a lot of money, but that's okay. Uh, that's okay. In a sense, with all the people using the software that we built, I might be a billionaire in terms of users, and in terms of people you affect, it doesn't make me a billionaire in terms of money that I've earned. But then again, that was never my focus, so I'm, I'm not sad about that in any way. Any other questions? All right. Uh, One more? Still coding or else? Of course. And what kind of project do you work on now? Um, right now, we are building an AI, an artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm not building it because this is way above my understanding, but we're working together with the University of Leicester in England. They have a big data science team. They're building an AI, and we are doing the, uh, the web part, basically bringing the AI to the internet, making it accessible through microservices. That's kind of the stuff that we're doing. Cannot say too much about it because I'm, again, under MBA and stuff, but yeah, that's basically what we're doing. Very interesting. Working together with data scientists that have no clue about the web, but have clues about a lot of complex uh, math, which is really, really interesting. We're making good steps. We have the first prototype ready. The next step is um, pitching that for investors. Yep. One last question? No? All right. Uh, One more? Yeah. What was the question? Do you have some tech to recommend? Do I have some? Tech to recommend. TED Talks. Um, uh, yeah, your, your last TED Talk was really nice. Yeah, I gave a talk myself at TEDx in Hassel, so if you look me up, you will find my TED Talk. It's, um, it's part of, the, I tried to explain my whys in the talk, so that's interesting, and the, the Joomla story, so you can find it. Um, <coughs> other TED Talks that are very interesting are, uh, look up talks from Kurzweil. They're very interesting. Um, some of the people that I mentioned have talks. Um, basically, if you go to TED and you look up the, the top 10, 15 talks, you should, you should see those all. Like the top 10 talks, you need to have seen them all. It takes you, it's like, it's like bench watching for like three, four hours, you have seen them all. This is really awesome stuff. Um, there is one very interesting one, I think it's the top two talk from Sir Kenneth Robinson where he talks about uh, the problems with the education system and, and why the education system is failing. Oh my God, I've seen it. Yeah, a very interesting one. And then, the talks from Kurzweil where he explains singularity, very interesting one. Um, look them up, there's so much stuff out there. All right, all right guys, after uh, Johan's uh, inspirational lunch talk, I guess you're all very eager to go back to the first floor and start building the world as uh, described by Johan.